In this interview, it's all about artificial intelligence as it applies to photography. This is TWIP. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode, another TWIP interview. This one's all about artificial intelligence from one of the lead engineers at Skyloom. These are the folks that are behind Luminar and Aurora and other software applications that you might know. One thing to note about this interview is that from this point forward, after I finish talking here, it's going to be audio only. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see some static photos of me and my guest. And if you're listening in the podcast feed, you won't even know that anything was different. All right, on with the show. So I'm here with Mr. Alex Sosinenko. He's uh, one of the brains behind the software that everyone's been raving about lately. Um, and some of the products that come out of a company called Skyloom. And in specifically about this interview, I didn't want to talk about the software and just sort of do an overview of the software. I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about artificial intelligence and some of the features that that Skyloom is putting into their latest software to leverage this sort of machine learning and, and AI type functionality. So Alex is the guy behind that at Skyloom and has agreed to come on and talk to us about it and kind of get to the bottom of uh, the the intelligence in the software. So Alex, welcome to the show, man. Hi, nice, nice to have me and you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank you for doing this. Well, first of all, let's let's just cut right into it. So artificial intelligence, it's all the rage, right? We keep hearing it from Apple, you know, in, in iPhones, we're hearing about it from Adobe, we're hearing AI in cars for self driving. Um, we've heard Elon Musk say it's the greatest threat to mankind, right? <laughs> so what is your, give me your sort of top line thoughts on artificial intelligence as it applies to the world of creatives and, and graphic and photos. Yeah, okay. So um, first of all, let's be honest. There is no artificial intelligence created up until today. And there is a little probability that it's going to be in nearest 10 years or 20 years, something like that, in my personal opinion and opinions of many people on the scene. And we are talking about um, general artificial intelligence that, that can think like a human being, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that is being AI today, it's called AI. It's basically a so-called deep learning. And the deep learning is, um, is one of the ways to do machine learning. So it's just a way to teach machine to do really some small and specific tasks. And deep learning is so powerful because in some domains, it even outperforms humans, but those domains are really small and narrow. That's just like general overview. Yeah. No, no. You do remember years ago, there was this online app. I don't know if it's still around, but there was this online app called Eliza. You remember that thing where it was it, you could go in, they called they claimed it was the first AI or artificial intelligence where you could go in and, and have a conversation online and you would type a oh, phrase. Yeah. yeah, you type a phrase and it would respond with something. Basically, it was like hot. You'd say, hey, how are you doing? And it would say, hey, how are you doing? You know, <laughs> so. Right. That's that's not AI, obviously. And and that's not the first time when everybody's uh, claiming that AI is here. It was like another hype, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. It, it was using total different mathematics behind, total different from what we have today. But it was another hype about AI is coming, AI is here, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change everything. It didn't happen. And the current AI is much better than the previous version, but still, uh, we are far away from a human level of thinking. Yeah. What we have, we have a really great tool that can really um, powerfully solve specific tasks, uh, especially in the domain of vision and image processing. And we are using this tool inside of our software, but it's, it's like really far away from what you mean by artificial intelligence on, of a human. Now we on the on the show we talk you know we, we we touch on this topic from time to time as it as it pops up in the news but as you know it's been showing up more and more um, like we said at the top of the show especially with you know iPhones doing all this crazy stuff after you take the 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 image and which is why I was intrigued to have this conversation with you so I want to I want to paint a picture paint a picture of what I think the the future might look like you know and I when I say future I mean like two three years down the line. 
for AI driven software and tell and I want to I want to overlay that and have you overlay on where we're going where Skyloom is going with this stuff. So what I what I envision is one day we'll have cameras that you that will be able to detect objects in a scene where whether it's people I mean you can do that now but you know detect people trees, cars, children, food and then make exposure decisions based on that um and guide you through taking the particular kind of photo that you want, not just on the exposure side, but also maybe in, in some degree on the composition side and, and other things. Are we moving in that direction, sort of a really smart program auto, or is, it, is AI, from your perspective, something completely different? That is one of the applications of AI, and we are not really moving there because we are already there. The, the, like the things you described, they already exist, and they're pretty simple, and they're pretty easy to make, actually. There's no big stuff behind that, so the smart cropping exists, the smart composition exists, the, the outer exposure based on the scenery it, it can be done. Uh, it, I, th I think we have something not not deep learning based, but something like that, simpler to do the automated role development. And obviously, we have the face detection, we have the object detection, we have the scenery detection. It's all it's already in there. It's the question of how you use them and how you package those technologies. What kind of user experience you're gonna create using those things? Because detecting objects in the image is really simple and really powerful these days. The precision is extremely high. The question is what you're going to do with that knowledge, that there is a face that is 60% of the shot or whatever. And then how, do you, how, how does the software, so dovetailing us into the work that you're doing at Skyloom, what, what does Skyloom's AI look like? What, it, what is it doing or, or helping me as a photographer do that I couldn't do before? Yeah, so we have um, a number of different uh, effects in Skyloom software, in Luminar mostly. Um, so the, the, the basics is AI accent filter, and now we have recently released the AI Sky Enhancer. And AI Sky Enhancer is really our proof of concept and demonstration of technology of so-called semantic segmentation. So what's going on in the background when you apply this filter? Um, the neural network that was trained on a huge number of images actually separates different layers of your image can, that have different objects in them. So it separates houses from the sky, trees from the houses, grass from the trees, etc., etc., etc. So all the things you would actually be doing if in Photoshop or whatever, if you need to apply different effects on different objects of your of your of your image, right? So it's been done automatically in the background. We have around 200 layers containing different images, uh, in average for every image, uh, containing different objects, right? And then we apply different effects on different parts of the image. And the uh, AI Sky Enhancer is the simplest technology. We, we, we are testing this approach with our users. It's the simplest thing you can detect on the image because it is, it's just sky. It's super simple to understand even for a dumb machine. So this this is a way of approach that we're taking. So for example, we have, I don't know when they're going to be released. I'm not into the product release cycle, but we have same approaches for architecture enhancer, uh, foliage enhancer, portraits enhancer, skin smoothing based on uh, semantic segmentation of facial features, et cetera, et cetera. Does it make sense? That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And my brain is spinning because having spent many, many hours in Photoshop trying to isolate, isolate those objects and apply corrections individually, it sounds like you're telling me that in the future or maybe even in the near future, the software is going to be able to remove the necessity to do that kind of masking and automatically say, that's a tree and build a mask and that's a person build a mask and that's a sky and build a mask. And that is architecture and build a mask and, and apply smart corrections automatically to those individual elements in the scene. Is, am I hearing that correctly? That is correct. And that is already going on in the latest update of Luminar with AI sky enhancer. So in the background, it detects almost everything, but, we are just now testing the user experience. So right now, AI scan enhancer, for example, is just a one slider, right? Just make it better. And there is no capability to choose the mask and 
uh, attach any effects, any other extra effects to this mask. But And we actually didn't thought about it. We just wanted to make it simple, one slider cool solution. But some of the pro users, they asked, okay, I, I, I don't want your ways of enhancing the sky. I just want your mask. And that, that's a question of user experience. So there's so many things you can do with AI, but uh, the, the, the right way to package it that is cool for everyone. That's the question, in my opinion. Yeah, that's always the user interface and, and the presentation to the to the end user. So, so Alex, what what about this? So, another use case, right? So, uh, wedding photographers, for example, and I know some cameras kind of do this now inside the camera, where they can they can detect per, you know, individual people versus just a person. Are we going to get to a point where I can say? You know, I'm a wedding photographer, for example, and the most important subjects of the day are obviously going to be the bride and the groom, and then a hierarchy of people after that, you know, the parents and whatever. And w or will AI get to a point where I can say, hey, bride and the groom, I don't care where they are in the photo, please base the exposure on them because they're the most important ones, and then go from there. Is that possible or is that is that sort of yeah. science fiction? And, and now you just, you know, you just jumped ahead into 10 years from today. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what seems actually pretty simple from a basic human standpoint, right, is just like detect the bride, whatever. It's easy. It's a huge leap for machine because, it, I mean, if we train the network just to detect the bride, especially this type of subject, right, it can be easy. But if we try to teach the machine to detect, let's say, the most important human or object in the scene. That becomes a really, really complicated question because you have to, to teach the machine about what is important. And it, so you have to teach the machine about human relationships, human emotions, the, the delicate nuances of social interactions, etc., etc. And we are so far away from this. We just... I mean, I mean, I'm not saying Skylum. I'm saying the scientific world doing AI research in general. So that, there's a huge leap. If you're talking about bright specifically, then yes, it's, it's not a big deal. But the, the most important object, it's a very complicated human thing that exists only in, in your mind. And what is important for you can be not important for me and so different for everyone, right? Right. So it's there subjective. Is a, you, it, it's subjective. There is no benchmark on that. And this is a question where we can actually create the general uh, artificial intelligence when we're able to teach the machine about this kind of stuff. So what what what's the limitation in in this field of work? Is it is it processor speed or is it something else? What what are we waiting for in order to to get to the level where where machines can can make those kind of subjective decisions? That's a good one. Um, there's a lot of things. So the, the, the most common opinion is that, first of all, we, have, we are missing the basic building blocks, mathematical building blocks. They don't exist today. Uh, that's, that's the one thing. So the theory isn't there yet. Then the computational power isn't there yet, even approximately. Um, right now, I think it's... 10 millions or something less powerful, the most powerful GPUs is less powerful than human brain or something like that. Oh, wow. I'm afraid to be, yeah, I'm afraid to be uh, wrong, but it's something like that. It's orders and orders of magnitude. It's not like 10 times or 100 times or something like that. It's huge. And, so the, and, and the, the power efficiency is also out of any comparison. What we run on GPUs today, they, they can burn 10 kilowatts per hour, right? And human brain just needs few few burritos to be okay for the whole day. The whole day. Yeah. So we're not there yet in terms of computational efficiency, power efficiency, uh, lots of things, that data and theory. So the, the, we are pretty far away, to be honest. But in terms of image processing and scene understanding, we are almost there yet for lots of practical applications. That is great. That is great. Yeah. And that and that kind of sets my mind at ease from the uh, the beginning of the conversation where, you know, we were talking about Elon Musk and, and him saying AIs are going to take over the world if we're still working on this sort of them being able to understand these these kinds of subjective concepts and and the whole power to computational the energy to computational power equation, then they probably won't be taking over the world anytime soon.
But then, Alex, yeah, what, what, right. what about this? So the one of the questions that pops up in, in sort of cocktail conversations about AI is, well, OK, if 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 people like Alex are making these super smart softwares that can do most of the work for us, what's the need for a photographer? Are we going to are we going to live in a world in the future where a, uh, you know, not that it's going to take over, but the professional photographer profession will kind of go the way of driving a stick shift car. You know, are we moving in that direction or, or do you see it as this becoming a tool to allow us to do more things than we could ever do before? That is actually a realistic threat, especially for photographers, in my opinion. And my answer to that is you guys have to develop creativity. Yeah. Because we are so far away from making a creative machine. All those creative neural nets, they're not really creative. They're just good at imitating the data set that was shown to them. They're perfect imitators, but they're not creative in any sense. And yes, we're going to make tools that are going to make work of photographers faster or even automate some parts of the photographer's pipeline, like retouching the photos or whatever, doing basic uh, layers, extractions, applying effects in some smart ways, right? And this, this is going to give you more time for creativity. Yeah. And think of that. Every neural net was trained on a data set. Let me give you an example. So there is a great data set coming from like maybe seven years ago. Uh, it's called AVA data set. And there is a neural network called NEMA. Uh, trained by Google for the first time, it's it's it stands for neural image assessment. So it's a neural net that was trained on a subjective scores of images and photos given by random people. So it's basically they take in their website something like Flickr or something, uh, took the ratings of images and trained a neural net to predict the scores for those images and th this basically gives you a net that can give you an aesthetic estimation of the quality of the image you're on the same page with me right so that yeah. that's really good and really impressive in my opinion but think of this it was trained on a on a data set that gives you the average aesthetic understanding of the average person because it's an aggregated information about lots of different people so it's a Usual layman, if I can say so, right? Making an aesthetic estimation of, of, of the image. It's, it doesn't have any complicated sense of aesthetics, this neural net. But it can give you really good uh, scores of images of a typical middle, middle range quality. So think of this. You've made 100 photos. You came home and you need to classify really bad ones from really good ones so you can focus your work on the good ones. And this this network can help you do that really fast, but it will never understand the difference between two really good photos. It will never understand what what makes a different difference between just a good photo and a brilliant photo that can go to MoMA, for example. Mm -hmm. So we are not there yet, but we are good at covering eighty percent of routine tasks and routine things that you can do with the images. That is that is fantastic. You answered my mostly answered my next question, which was one of the one of the main problems or issues facing photographers, I think, both amateurs and advanced amateurs and professionals is the culling process. You know, it, we've got mountains of photos that are sitting there the most of them suck, but there are some jewels in there. But we don't go through the mountain because it takes a lot of work to go through all those photos to find the jewels. Wouldn't it be great if there was a robot that could help us go in and say, OK, I know you took 2000 photos, but these 25 are the ones that you should be really focusing on. I don't know which of these is the best because I don't go that far, but I know the rest of them aren't good and these are good. Are you saying that we're we're close to that or are we there now where it can give me a, a good yeah, head start yeah. on the culling process? Yeah, we are there now. At least, at least on the technical side, I, I have those networks like trained um, on my own, and we are just thinking of the best way to implement them. And wow. we are testing the user case scenarios to to actually give people an ability to use them in a way that is non-scary, non-intrusive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? 
And to be, to be honest, uh, the, everybody has something like that in the iPhones, for example, because every iPhone already is doing the image classification and catalogs of images based on what was there, when was there, where was it. And it's it's already there. There's nothing nothing really complicated about that. It's a question of user interaction, mostly, as I said many times. That's so fantastic. So, Alex, how do you how how do you see the future? And you're you're the obviously a perfect person to ask this. The future of AI imaging. What's where? I know you know things are there's it's never ending right where it's always going to be progressing and getting better and better but if you put a if you put a finite limit on it and say 20 years from now where would you like things to be or where do you envision the the tools that we have uh being available what what do you what does that future look like Okay so I I'm not Kurzweil but <laughs> um, um I'm not sure if it's 10 years 20 years or 30 years but I'm um ideologist of this concept of camera-less photography. Um, I do think that, the, that there is a thing called GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, that is extremely popular today in media. It's those kind of networks that are able to hallucinate, and they're able to see things that are not, not there. You, I think you've heard about them, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the concept is that in five, ten years, you would be able to type the description of the image that you want to have, and it will generate an infinite amount of different versions of this image of photorealistic quality that you can choose one and go on further with this image. You understand what I'm talking about? So Absolutely. I'm typing Absol in. So I can type yeah, in. I, yeah. Uh, I I really need a. I'm working on a piece, and I need uh, a sandy beach that's sparsely populated with beautiful people, uh, blue ocean, and and a blue sky. Maybe it's California midday, and maybe a few seagulls in the sky, and it would make right. that for you. And it will give you 50 ideas, 50 variants of photorealistic photos that were non-existent one second before. And th this is something that will happen it, because it's not a theory. It's, we, we can already do that, but the, the resolution of those images is like 64 by 64 pixels. And they're not really photorealistic, but they're somewhat. But it's every year, it, it's getting better and better. You know, is, it, is, that, ideas, is that like yeah. virtual reality, Alex? I mean, that, that sounds like a slowed down version of, of, of world building where I could step into that world and it's on the fly generating kind of like a video game, right? It's generating yeah, the scene yeah. as it's, I see it. I add five more years and few technological advances and you will be there. It's going to be a on the fly regenerated 3d world of photorealistic quality that was built specifically for you, specifically for you, uh, at this second, based on your emotions, your who you are, and what you'd like to see, and it will it will disappear in the next second, but it will be of the perfect quality. That that that, that that's going to happen for sure. Wow, that that's exciting. Okay, well, to wrap it up, um, the as much as you can share, I like to ask this question when I do interviews. I know, you know, being respectful, your software company, you can't reveal any unreleased or future facing products, but give us an idea of where Luminar is going in regards to, to AI. You mentioned, you know, there's this, you know, the sky enhancers there now, but there's, there's architecture enhancer and, and foliage enhancer and skin and that sort of thing. Where do you see Luminar with these sorts of tools? Where would you like the software to be in, you know, the next two to three years? That's a good one. Um, I'm not saying that anything that I will say is going to be a feature someday because I have um, no control over that. I'm just I can just explain to you that yes, we think that the tools should be of more high level. So things like AI sky enhancer, AI maybe they won't be all called something enhancer AI. Maybe there will be some another ways to name it. But still, uh, what is your routine operation that you're doing with images? It, sh it should be automated using one slider and using AI and deep learning in the background. I need better raw development. I need better HDR. I need better skin. I need better portraits. I need to make out-of-focus images or blur, blur something really mm -hmm. easily 
based on the semantics of the image and the contents of the image. This is kind of a near-term future that we are working on. Same goes for keyword search, classification, aesthetic evaluation. That's, that's all is real as for today. Um, and, and we are obviously working on all of that, just planning how to release it in a smart way and make sure there is a cycle of release, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's kind of nearest futures, future. And middle term one, um, I don't know, we, we haven't really agreed on possible versions of this middle term future, but that's my um, separate opinion that I would be interested in looking into more kind of emotional image processing. So in the end of the day, what you what you're trying to do when you move all those sliders, when you're editing the image, you're trying to give some emotion, some some idea, some extra meaning, right? You, you're mm-hmm. trying to encode some information that wasn't pre- wasn't present in this image, and you're making layers of emotions on top of it. Why are we making all those sliders that represent mathematical equations, uh, like I don't know what else, brightness, whatever, something really simple? It's it's math, right? Yeah. You don't need sliders about mathematics. You need sliders about emotions. I would love to have a photo editor that that can add sadness in a smart way, that can <sighs> add joy in, in, a, in one slider. And this slider will be unique for you. It would be only your way of making joy. So I'm talking about not only personalization of... Um, I'm not... Not only understanding of the image, but understanding of who is using this slider and photo editor at the moment and how this person sees the world. This is kind of a mid-term future for photo editing, in my opinion. That is that is that's really exciting. So, Alex, the last the last wrap up question is um, about competition, right? And and the direction that other software image processing software manufacturers are going. You know. Obviously, the big guy would be Adobe, and then there's smaller players around. Um, how do you, how do you classify where Skyloom is going with regard to being smarter about image processing and artificial intelligence versus where the other guys are going? Is in other words, is the entire industry moving in the direction of artificial intelligence, or is Sky is Skyloom sort of a lone wolf saying, you know, we're placing bets on AI. You guys can go over and build your your filters and presets and all that stuff, and we're going to go in this direction. What's what's your opinion on that? Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, come on, the, the world is huge and AI is booming everywhere, and everybody's making a bet on that. Adobe, of course, Google is making impressive things, incredible things. They mostly stay inside of scientific journals. Uh, some of them never make it to the production versions, but they're really strong. The, the cool thing about AI is that the fast that the field is moving really in synchrony between all the companies because there is a culture of knowledge sharing in AI that is really strong. There is a huge, strong community of AI researchers, and there is a culture of sharing the research really fast. Even even if it's corporate research under five walls of IP protection, it makes to the journal and it, and it's becoming public really fast. So in these terms, we can say that almost all companies, including Skylum, they have almost even, ac- even access to the knowledge about how to make AI. Of course, there are some really deep and secret stuff going on in huge companies like Google and Uber and you name it, but maybe we don't need it to, as of today. And this knowledge will become public in six months, one year, for mm-hmm. sure. Everybody's going to be there. So it's not about driving the technology as of today in, in fields of image processing. It's about driving the vision, driving the user interaction, and finding a ways to rob, rob and present these, these things to an end user or, or, or to a business user because we have business solutions as well cloud-based solutions using neural nets and deep learning for image processing. It's about what kind of product we want to make and vision. It's not about technology, in my opinion. Yeah, it's all about the the, the product or the, the way that you can present that complex power and technology in a, in a way that people can actually use it, right? Yeah, and enjoy, and enjoy using it. It's about uh, joy of editing photos, right? Yeah, yeah. 
That's great. It sounds like, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, from what you just said, it sounds like you you consider a Google more, Not I don't want to say more of a, a competitor than Adobe, but on equal footing, at least, in terms of, of pushing image processing, especially cloud-based image processing, to the next level. Is that is that fair? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I respect Adobe in all ways they have really great researchers and they have really great collaborations with research institutions but in image processing google does things that impress me much more wow they're really strong they're really strong and those those things about hallucinations and generating non-existent images uh, google is at least on the same page with adobe and that that's fantastic. Alex, they have, they have Google Pixel. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. They have Google Pixel 2 and 3. It has lots of AI packed in the camera, so they have good reason to do that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's you know, it's funny you say that. That's one of the one of the things that I regret about getting an iPhone is all the, all the the crazy technology that Google is putting into the Pixel phones with regard to image processing. Um, you know, but on the same on the same token, Apple is no slouch either with with what they're doing with the uh with photography on the iphone right so yeah yeah so yeah and in the end we all win when you know the photographers win while smart people like you are making these tools that allow us to make better images hopefully i the, the one term that i i'm one of the terms i'm taking out of this from what you said is um the hallucinations and and cameraless photography that is I never heard those two words used in a sentence together. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Keep, keep those, promote those. That's the future, I think. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, a, it's all coming. Well, Alex, thank you so much, man. Thank you for staying up for this interview. I appreciate it. Uh, where, where, just for people that are wondering where you are in the world, where, where are you located right now? Uh, Ukraine. It's Kiev, a uh, country of Ukraine. We have a development office here. Wow. Wow. And what, we're right now, as we record this, it's 9.45 a.m. What time is it there? Uh, 4.45. I'm sorry, 7.45 p.m. Okay, good. It's not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Alex, thank you so okay. much. Thanks for, thanks for coming on This Week in Photo. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, that was cool. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Take care, man. This is Twitter.